Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, first, I would like to thank Centrum uh, Modernes Griechenland for this invitation to speak here in Berlin. The timing of this talk could not be better and more telling. Um, I have arrived today in Berlin in the afternoon, flying from Athens, and I took liberty to pick a, a bunch of newspapers from the hotel, just for a, the first pages that you might have seen already, but I'll show you in a certain order and disorder. We have titles such as Athen Pokert bis zum Schluss. Yeah? Then we have um, another title, Der Hellas Wahnsinn. Yeah? It's quite a title. But we have an, auch a, <coughs> a more telling um, third title, which I find more um, relevant, which is Countdown für Europa. So uh, from the proverbial Greek madness, we shift slightly towards the idea that my, we may be facing something that is a countdown for a much larger project, which is called Europe. And this Europe is not, a, again, isolated continent. It's not an island, but it's a part of a global situation that, is, that has been accelerating and perhaps not in, exactly in the right direction um, lately. So this is an introduction more from um, how things stand today. And we've been reading and, and, and watching television last week, and we know that things are not standing um, uh, in a good way, uh, at least not yet. Uh, I would like to thank Professor Dr. Peter Andre Alt and uh, uh, Professor Dr. Annette Gerstenberg and Professor Dr. Militiadis Speklivanos for, um, for the words of introduction. Um, uh, to this talk, which will be based on the proposal that I made um, not recently, not really inspired by, um, by the worsening of the situation uh, in Greece and between Greece and Germany during the last year, but I wrote it in mid-2013. Mid um, so that was already uh, quite a while ago. Uh, I presented it in, in Kassel to the International Selection Committee in November uh, 2013, and I, I, I got appointed to, um, to organize Documenta uh, in November 2013. And since then, uh, we have established an office uh, also in Athens, and we've been trying from this office to understand a little bit what, what, can we, what we can do um, in Greece and uh, um, further also in relation to that part of the documenta that will be uh, taking place in Kassel. Um, as I said, I arrived today in Berlin uh, on a flight from Athens, and I would like to, uh, uh, I wanted to return tomorrow to Athens, but there is no daily flight connection between the capital of Greece and the capital of Germany, which I must consider here as a significant, significant, significant obstacle on both practical and symbolic level. Um, then, uh, b before I start with, uh, with this, with this Fortrack or Forlism, uh, I would like to relate to the values that have been somehow uh, stamped on me without me previously agreeing uh, to be stamped with such, which are here. You know, this is um, truth, justice, and liberty. And these are the guiding core values for the Freie Universität Berlin. I try to make an ad hoc Greek translation to go you know, further to the root um, of these terms. So to go from the Latin terms that to me relate more to categories that are used in, um, in law uh, to, to the older categories that have a certain, uh, whose, let's say, ph philosophical significance shines through, uh, such as Aletheia. Um, I'm not sure about justice dikaiosini, correct me if I'm wrong and Liberty Eleftheria, um, which um, in Greece has this very militant sound, I think, Eleftheria. Um, <clears throat> well, we have these three uh, core values formulated in Latin here and retranslated ad hoc and in an amateurish way into Greek. 
which I would like to complete with three um, a little bit softer categories that I think are of much more use today for understanding the situation between, um, between Greece and Germany <coughs> and also in Europe because Greece, as I say, is all, all, always understood in, in the entire talk that I'm going to deliver as a parse prototype of a larger situation. And these values that I would like to refer to are solidarity, trust and friendship which are not opposed to truth, truth, justice, and liberty, but they give a certain inflection, perhaps, uh, to these values that seem to be, um, to these values here, that seem to be of a kind that are usually carved in stone. I would prefer <clears throat> values on which to build relationships between people to be rather writ on water, which is, you know, another uh, reference, let's say, to the, to the romantic period, because Writing on water is, um, it, you know, this is from John Keats. It's written on his um, tomb in, in, in the non-Catholic cemetery in Rome. Um, you know, these are the words uh, from Keats. And um, here lies the one whose name was writ in water. So writing in water as carving in stone, um, you know, these are the two opposite modes of, uh, let's say, presenting and sort of founding values on which, we, on which we want to work. And now I'd like to move to the, uh, to the talk proper. Documenta Fortina, as you might have heard, uh, Castle Learning from Athens, preliminary notes and concept. Documenta is generally considered to be the single most important recurring exhibition dedicated to contemporary art. It was famously born in Kassel in 1955 out of, <clears throat> out of the sense of cultural urgency felt in post-World War II Germany, a decade after Nazi rule was brought to an end. And it is my belief that this primary sense of urgency behind an experimental exhibition und undertaken and understood as a harbinger of change and a means <clears throat> to build both a national and international community with the help of an aesthetic exp and intellectual experience needs to be restored in the 14th edition of Documenta, scheduled to take place in 2017. The question of how to, do, how to best do it is my present concern, but in order to properly get to that question and, and its possible answers, I must go back a bit to the history that has occurred between 1955 and today, and the various Documenta that have taken place in that nearly 50-year period. Well, 60-year period, actually. Between Documenta 1 and Documenta 2, Documenta GmbH was established to secure the perpetuation of the exhibition, which in this way became a cultural institution and has been continuing in the city of Kassel until today. The establishment of this enterprise marked the transition from the original idea that stood behind the first Documenta, that was conceived as a tool for changing the present, to a format that could be repeated and deployed in subsequent iterations, which at times actively engaged the surrounding political and social context, and at times simply stood by as witness to them. The paramount and most interesting part of any approach to Documenta consists in resolving the question of how to fill the vessel it provides with contents that represent a far-sighted response to the current situation in the arts, thus making a significant statement on contemporary culture society and politics. A statement comparable in its impact then to the one that the first documenta had. If the first documenta in 1955 was created in the wake of an overarching need for the material and social reconstruction of Germany, that requirement paralleled the need to create a common platform of experience and discussion of values for the nation's citizens and later on internationally as well. And indeed, the contemporary art exhibition provided a plausible forum where such, such a discussion could take place. While that first documenta, engaging the broken traditions of the avant-garde art, was staged among the ruins and flowers, because it was staged first during the Bundesgartenschau in Kassel, so next to the f exhibition of uh, you know, flowers and uh, plants in general that were planted on the, on the piles of rubble from um, from the buildings in Kassel that were burnt in carpet bombings of the, 
of the Allied forces during the Second World War. So while that first documenta was staged among the ruins and flowers, this context allowed it to both look backward to the past and daringly point towards possible futures. The key task undertaken by the curator of the first documenta, Arnold Bode, was to ensure that the continuity of development in Western European modern art, interrupted by the wartime years of historical catastrophe, might be reinstated. So we're talking about Western European modernism here. Led by Arnold Bode and structured according to an interpretative framework drawn by an art historian and curator, Werner Haftmann, Documenta was bound to the idea of modernist progression in avant-garde painting and sculpture, including its post-war continuations through its second, third, and fourth curatorial edition. In 1968, Documenta 4 was confronted with a critique and social dissent that marked this period. Both the audience and the featured artist called for more participation and the radical reformulation of the show. In the much debated 1972 edition, Harald Seyman, the curator, embarked on a fully octorial model of curating and proposed a 100-day event to replace the somewhat worn formula of his predecessor's 100-day museum. The four editions that followed, with all their particular differences, moved away from the show's ambition to be an all-embracing statement on contemporary art and society. Instead, a more pluralistic, media-specific, and artist-centered curatorial vision reigned. Coinciding with the late phase of the Cold War, Documenta entered the process of becoming a heritage, taking a distance to political realities and coexisting with the general consolidation of the art market around the Western developments that gradually subsumed the great international experiment of minimalism and conceptual art. This curatorial state of things got pointedly challenged by the paradigm shifting Documenta 10, organized by Catherine David in 1997. Her exhibition brought into play new geographies and historical trajectories around the globe, restoring the show's conceptual edge while declaring politics and poetics as an inseparable whole. Documenta 10 was the first to make visible the shift of the world's cultural map after 1989. Without the imag imaginary enemy, a world economy based on the exploitation of entire nations and peoples, suppressing differences in the stalemate of ideological confrontation between the ill-governed, quasi-totalitarian East and the self-righteous, democratic West, which is a polar view that in the future would be replaced by the distinction between the West and the South, the West and radical Islam, or the West and anything else, depending on its need. So that vision has to undergo a radical adjustment. In 2002, Okwi Envesor, um, in his Documenta 11, continued this intellectual project, expanding the show's global out outreach. He brought the discursive, critical orientation of Documenta 10 to a logical consequence, through the establishment of numerous decentralized platforms as an ar archipelago in Vienna, New Delhi, and Santa Lucia, Freetown, Lagos, Johannesburg, and Kinshasa, and then in Kassel itself dedicated to political and cultural subjects such as democracy unrealized, transitional justice, and creolization, these platforms demonstrated that art should not be seen in isolation from the condition of global society, firmly asserted a post-colonial pluralistic view of the world, and accomplished a change of focus from art objects to political and social transformation processes. The cultural expressions articulated in Documenta 11 voiced out this change of focus with unprecedented force, revealing the disastrous effects associated with the quick advance of the global economy and allowing for a more layered picture of the contemporary world to emerge. Including a significant number of non-Western artists and thinkers, Documenta 11 constituted a historical and cultural caesura from which any serious attempt to embrace the present in contemporary art must begin anew. If Documenta 10 and Documenta 11 again positioned the exhibition as a tool of political and social reflection, instead of keeping it limited to an exercise in curatorial excellence and the vehicle for showcasing contemporary art in line with the zeitgeist, the two most recent editions took place among the growing uncertainty caused by the past decade's changes in global economy and dramatic shifts in balance of world power. Furthermore, such geopolitical shifts were paralleled by the increasing diversity of artistic idioms and formats that could not be brought together under one common denominator of a thematic exhibition. 
In a reflexive turn, inquiring into formative moments of modernity and the legacy of modernism, uh, modernism around the globe, Roger Burgel and Ruth Noack's Documenta 12 strive to identify and enliven enlightenment ideas, binding the show with the larger cultural history of Kassel while looking back to lesser known intellectual artistic traditions and investigating the meaning of display concepts <coughs> applied in Bode's Documenta in 1955. Caroline Christoph Bakarjiev's Documenta 13 exposed the growing difficulty in continuing the revisionist ambitions of the exhibition while keeping the stability of its institu institutional setup and leaving its most basic tenet, the main location limited to Kassel, untouched. This, despite the curator's attempt at establishing outposts of the show far from Kassel and most notably in war-torn Kabul. <clears throat> the specific timing and choice of locale were precisely the factors that once allowed Documenta to develop in what is now a half-century-old venture. Needless to say, however, the socio-political parameters that made Documenta urgent in 1955 are no longer in play. In 2013, Kassel was ge geopolitically and culturally a very different place than it was in 1955, when it was located on the frontier of the liberal West and defined as a cultural beacon shining bright in the night of divided, war-ravaged, reconstruction-minded Europe. But today, life, it seems to be elsewhere. To that end, I believe we have again arrived at the point where fundamental questions about place and time need to be asked in order for the exhibition to continue as an efficient measure against the passive cultural mood defined by the expectations of the contemporary audience and art market. Documenta 14 should devise ways to circumvent this spectacular regime. The world's greatest exhibition must again become a critical agency instead of acting as witness, stage or prey of the spectacle. I believe that for this to happen, Documenta, which has so far been primarily bound to one place and a predictable five-year rhythm, needs to be radically, if temporarily, redefined. In a world undergoing the profound ruptures that have been taking place at increasing speed in this century, Documenta must again seek for its vocation. Documenta 14 should fully embody both its role as a space of reflection of the present, on, the, on the present and as a tool of transformation, which I think it did deliver in diverging contexts and ways in 1955, 1972, 1997, and 2002. I feel it is time, as unclear and unstable as the current state of things may appear, to open the exhibition to the fleeting present, as is reflected in a wide range of cultural practices taking place in locations and contexts of productions that do not overlap with the art world as we know it, geographically and economically. While looking at the exhibition's historical development, I came to the conclusion that it should be extended to another city, coinciding with the show that will take place in Kassel. The conclusion was based on the premise that the position of host the Documenta played toward even the widest variety of guests invited to Kassel in the past editions, however generous, is not sufficient. The position of host becomes ideologically difficult to maintain if the host never dares to assume the role of guest and leave home. Indeed, thinking about the future documenta, I sensed that the urgency of its beginnings was not there anymore and needed to be found again. And such a process had to be a quest that did not presuppose its own result or stick to one direction. The metaphor of the journey that we undertake in order to hold a better understanding of the world and of ourselves offers itself here. Such a trip once initiated, does not end in its own destination. It's not an exploration, but rather a drift, a form of willful estrangement that should lead to new realizations for those who undertake it. Therefore, as a programmatic move of the upcoming Documenta 14, I propose to organize the exhibition simultaneously in Kassel and Athens. These two projects, realized in different ways while learning from their respective places and from each other, will form two pictures that could never be superimposed to form a single image. Nor will the two shows be possible to grasp from a one vantage point. By asking Documenta visitors to take a similar route as its makers, 
the exhibition would also ask them to take their time, allowing a break in visibility while journeying between the two locations. My hope is that the exhibition will thus become an agent of change and a transformative experience for its audience and participants in both cities. The reasons for Athens itself and not another city are numerous. First, Athens rests in that part of, the, of Europe that seems to be a model example of the often extremely violent contradictions, fears and fragile hopes that cannot be dismissed as an internal problem of Greece or any other precarious contemporary democracy. Athens, like larger Greece, is currently struggling with the grave consequences of a deep economic crisis so singular to the geopolitics of today, which include the destruction of existing social relations vis-a-vis -vis the rise of right-wing populism amid the unresolved issue of increasing flows of illegal, migrant, illegal migrants. migrants. Coming from the Balkans, the Middle East, Africa and South Asia, after crossing the river of Ross or the sea, and, um, the migrants find that Greece becomes their final temporary station. And yet, this is not just a Greek problem, but an exemplification of the challenge that the entire European continent is facing in a far more dramatic way. Moreover, Athens embodies the uncertain future of Western European democracy in a world which is in the process of losing fixed points of reference. And thus, the proverbial Greek crisis makes Athens possibly the most productive location in Europe from which to think and learn about the future to come now. Documenta can only visit Athens as a guest with all the limitations and possibilities such status implies. The exhibition will need thorough on-site research to forge connections, including political ones, and to find local allies willing to engage. The terms of invitation will have to be negotiated and forms of collaboration will need to be developed. On the institutional level, Athens, with most of its publicly funded cultural institutions, um, including contemporary art venues, underfunded or on the verge of collapse, while being home to many art producers who work in spite of everyday hardship, could be a place where Documenta might play an important role, helping to rebuild a sense of confidence and community instigated by contemporary art. It is still not certain to me, at this point, what form the exhibition or the projects that constitute it should assume, nor it is evident which scale they should require. My intention is to turn the upcoming documenta into an exercise in institution building, instituting actually, that uses existing public venues, not necessarily dedicated to contemporary art, or creates a new one instead of simply sheltering under the sign of the temporary use of abandoned locations, which usually simply boost their prospective value as real estate for the monied classes. As far as the question of a new institution is concerned, from the many conversations I've had over the last five years with colleagues in Athens, artists and curators, as well as, as well of those working outside the visual arts field, I can sense not only frustration and feelings of helplessness caused by the petrified structures of cultural bureaucracy that are in place in Greece, but also the expectation for actual substantive change. Well aware of this need, the curatorial collective behind uh, the Athens Biennial um, Four edition that took place in 2013, which was conceived as an agora, they asked the fundamental question, now what? Learning from Athens, Documenta 14, could help to answer this question. Of essential importance to this vision of Documenta 14 is a deep-reaching analysis of the status quo and a carefully conceived definition of needs and goals with the interested representatives of the Athen arts scene and local cultural activists. This process of defining the terms and scope of engagement would already constitute a part of preparations for the next iteration of the show. The structure of the castle part of the exhibition could be informed by the notion of the copy, considered as a reflection and an imitation, image and counter image. This notion would be not placed in the thematic scope of the exhibition. In other words, Documenta 14 would not be about the copy per se, but it could serve as a generative and transformative grammar of the show with the original site of the Documenta 14 relocated to Athens and the reflection, echo, image, or lesson of Documenta projected as an exhibition to Castle. My use of these term, terms should be understood as against the normative 
order they usually imply, whereupon the authentic, genuine, and original is always judged superior to any poor copy or cheap imitation. Here, between Athens and Kassel, the political and socio-economic implications of this hierarchical order would be called into question. The presence and transfer of copies has been cru historically crucial for the self-perpetuation of the still persistent Europocentric cultural model that has always presupposed the superiority of the classical ideal in which Athens has long played its role as one of the central symbolic references. This was most explicit, uh, explicitly addressed in the naming of Athenaeum, a journal published by August Wilhelm and Carl Friedrich Wilhelm Schlegel between, 1970, uh, uh, between 1798 and 1800, which laid out the program of the German Romantic movement. In 2012, the classic reference was invoked in the new official slogan of the Greek Ministry for Touristic Development, Greece, all-time classic. The classic and timeless clearly continue to be the country's main selling points vis-a-vis -vis the Western European tourists. At the same time, both terms help to establish a reassuring distance to what they silently render as incidental and ephemeral, most certainly barbarian and dangerous. But the notion of the copy, historically related to neoclassicism as a costume of representation and self-assertion and, and self for the ruling classes, is even more pertinent today. Currently, the copy gains a different meaning in relation to contemporary image production in both the cultural and the commercial sectors and within the clashing politics of copying and copyright protection in the global capitalist economy, of which the luxury industry is the most visible media-driven part. I think it will be worthwhile to address the tension between the exclusivity inherent to the idea of the timeless classic and the inclusive, pervasive, invasive character of a poor copy through the concept of the double exhibition. Though the title of my proposal, Documenta 14, Castle Learning from Athens, is not meant to be the definitive title of the exhibition, I believe it gives a good impression of its intended twofold structure and the re reciprocity it would involve. I would like to underline the fact that this proposal for Documenta should not be mistaken as an attempt at an export of revolution which Documenta certainly is not being a strong institution in Germany that renews itself in five-year cycles, nor as a colonial conquest of yet unknown territory, bringing a top-down dynamic into a conflicted and precarious local situation. The fear of making mistakes would make a poor excuse for the lack of actual involvement. Instead, I suggest that Documenta 14 might become a fully embodied lesson in breaching the normative, economic, political, and geographic divisions, attempting a shared experience mediated by culture, and more specifically, the contemporary art exhibition. Here, Athens stands metonymically for that rest of the world that has not become, and could not yet become, a part of documenta in a proper sense, due to lacking privileges inherent to the position of the host. I imagine Documenta 14 as a manifestation in the form of two autonomous, simultaneous and related exhibitions in Kassel and Athens of the dissolution of barriers, of the dissolution of barriers separating those who lack the simplest means from those who are usually all too willing to give them lessons but seldom a hand. In this case, Documenta 14 might be an exhibition as a living document of the process of the formation of communality and the awareness of contemporary cultural production's role in this process. For most Greeks today, Germany and Chancellor Angela Merkel symbolically represent the feared ex external economic pressure on Greek citizens, who in the decades preceding the current crisis have been drained of their resourcefulness by international capital, by the selfishness of the Greek political and financial e elites, by an overgrown state administration and by conservative attitudes reinforced by the lack of strong secular tradition at home. Against this state of things and seeking inspiration in the formative period of 19th century modern Greek democracy, which inspired international emancipatory movements and saw European art institutions staging exhibitions to benefit the Greek insurgency, such as Zum Besten der Griechen, organized by Basler Künstlergesellschaft in 1826, Documenta 14 in Kassel and Athens would be essentially 
essentially about giving, about solidarity and about trust, and thus about putting lessons of past documenta into practice. While Athens is a physical and political location, it, has, it is also a screen for many cultural projections, including ones that risk becoming Orientalist fantasies. Historically, the exhibition in Athens would look back to the genealogy of democracy, its institutions and deficiencies and potentialities. Regarded now as a holiday, stop, holiday stopover city, Athens deserves to be visited and contemplated a bit longer than just to look at its ancient monuments on the way to the famous white and blue Greek islands. Like many cities cited, cited on lauded history and contemporary rupture, Athens holds multitudes. It is a multinational metropolis that struggles to be habitable. At present, it might be perceived as the most anti-classic city in Europe, contrary to the appearance introduced through its 19th century forced neoclassical remaking by German architects in service of the Bavarian Prince Otto, who was, the, who was king of Greece between 1832 and 1862. Athens is also the city that in 1933 welcomed a group of the leading architects of the fourth uh, Congress of Modern Architecture. While journeying from Marseille on ocean liner SS Patrice II, the Congress laid out new principles of urbanism that were subsequently published in Le Corbusier's Athens Charter in 1943, as well as inspired Joseph Louis Sert's 1942 book, Can Our Cities Survive? An ABC of Urban Problems, Their Analysis, Their Solutions, based on the proposals formulated by the CIAM, Congress of Modern Architecture. The latter book provided an argument for the post-war remaking of European cities in the modernist spirit, as opposed to nostalgic historicism and reconstruction, a debate that gained much currency in, currency in Kassel in 1955. And yet, contrary to the Siam participants' quintessentially rational visions, formalized as two papers of preparatory observations and provisional resolutions after visiting Athens, and while their vessel was crossing the sea before arriving at Athens, the city of Athens today is a sprawling, hyper-intense harbor city of the Mediterranean with collapsing public infrastructure and coping with endemic social problems. Certainly, modernization was a short-lived attempt in Greece and the role culture could have in this modernization process has not been used in full. In this context, I am convinced there will be a part to play for Documenta exhibition in Athens on both practical and symbolic level. As a principle, the show in Castle would involve the same artist who would make work in Athens. In this way, each artist would present his or her work on both locations, with the works being different or occasionally the same, responding to one or the two different contexts. This structure of gaps, disconcerting repetitions and dislocations would lend the entire exhibition something of a pendulum character, elaborating the impossibility of being in two places at the same time. The structure would embrace discontinuity rather than appear as a bridge in the form of projects that complete each other between the two locations or end up as two isolated sequences of displays addressing the specifics of each of the two sites separately. It is important that each of the two exhibitions create a completely different experience for the visitor with occasional shortcuts, flashbacks, allusions and déjà vu effects occurring between the two sites. Altogether, the exhibition should demonstrate an agility in addressing the real needs of the moment in real time as a sort of responsive program that learns from events and takes feedback into the process instead of sticking to one predetermined scenario during the three years of making. In my opinion as a curator, this agility is precisely what makes a great exhibition different from the pitch of a film script that has to tell the story according to the rules of the industry in order to be accepted by the producers. If the exhibition could be considered as a genre, or perhaps even a genre of genres, more than merely as a format, medium or structure that needs to be filled with content, then it needs time to grow and become something in its own right. To that end, my proposal aims to modify the received formula, the dispositive of documenta. Such change will certainly engage everyone involved in the fullest sense from politicians to organizers, 
art, artists and all other creative participants in a long and complex tra trajectory of actions. The main lines of the show should be visible in 2016, but I am fairly open in communication of the process from the moment it is certain that the two cities could work together. As a curator, I understand my task primarily as that of an enabling agent for social relations that emerge through the making and the concurrent discussion of art, and the making is always making it public. The operating principle in the making of Documenta 14 will be that of absorbing and responding to a variety of urgencies on both the political and the aesthetic level, with the aim to make the exhibition both contain and show some of its own history, much like a diary of a voyage that only begins at the point of arrival. In this, one might look at the difference between the in vitro and in vivo experiment. The former reaches a result that can be glimpsed already in the means adopted at the outset, while the latter constantly modifies, modifies its means to the facts encountered on the way. Documenta 14 should not create an autonomous reality as a utopian island of meta-discourse, but bring hope and discursive tools for understanding the re reality around us. This makes it a form of realism, I suppose, in which art is a cognitive extension of our existence and not an epic narration. In the context of Documenta 14, one of the aspects of the contemporary situation that I would like to explore in detail is the shift to immaterial labor and knowledge-based economy in the developed world and the moving of the material production to developing countries with the resulting geopolitical, economic, and cultural divide. At the same time, suspicious of the inevitability of any prescribed order of global development, equaling the reproduction of sameness, Documenta 14 should testify to the proliferation of new forms of communication, including social networks, with their mobility and liquidity, which enable new types of work to emerge and be mediated, bypassing political oppression and overcoming economic limitations of place. Against this background, the function and place of artistic production has to be thought about in new ways and from new positions, allowing one to see from outside the structures of an art world that is always self-adjusting to subsume new forms and distribution channels that artists themselves devise. These issues so far have seem to have been largely out of curatorial agendas and out of the agendas of museums, as these issues run counter to the accepted ways of understanding art and its mediation that we have been long accustomed to. History is what transforms documents into monuments, Michel Foucault once noted. Clearly, the monument refers not only to a work of architecture, but also to the collective action the architect Lina Bobardi later succinctly rejoined. I borrow both lines concerning the relationship between documents and monuments, thinking that this may be useful for our proposal for Documenta 14. And accordingly, I believe that this sense of collective action tackling the common task can be given a new life within the framework created by a great exhibition, such as Documenta. My proposal is not the result of a wish for the full authority of the curator as an author, which is an unsupportable position today. Instead, I wish to articulate the need to bring together many individuals and entities into a process that affects substantial change and brings about a sustainable result, both for the visitors of the exhibition and for those participating in its making, affecting their life after Documenta. By proposing a decisive shift that will consist in creation of the two resonating exhibitions in the two cities of Documenta 14, Kassel and Athens, I would like to return to the original role of Documenta as a document testifying to time and place and one that cannot be replaced by the monument to its own heritage. <clears throat> Thank you for your attention.